Okay, so today we're going to move on from meaning to belief. And I think most of what I'm going to, to say is, is about belief in general and belief in relation to metaphysics and objectivity. And then uh, a bit about science at the end. Uh, there isn't really enough time for me to say as much about science as I'd like to, actually. But anyway, it's, it's a, a bit of a... Um, an outline <laughs> of a view of science as well. Um, so, yeah, to start with, um, let's think about belief in relation to what we were looking at yesterday. So, we were talking about uh, meaning and the way in which uh, meaning is both cognitive and emotive and depends on embodied experience um, extended through metaphor. Um, so, when we start thinking about beliefs, well, as I mentioned yesterday, beliefs consist of um, propositions that they're usually expressed in sentences, um, which um, obviously depend on meanings. They have th those um, propositions have to be meaningful for us to start with in order to become beliefs. Um, what I mean by a belief generally is not just what you could call an explicit belief, so not just uh, what we say we believe, for example, but also includes implicit belief, so uh, what it could be inferred that we are committed to taking as the case uh, through our behaviour. Um, and that's partly because even when we're dealing with the left hemisphere, in terms of the brain, the, the, the left hemisphere tends towards this um, attachment to conscious representations at the moment, but um, I've certainly been assured by Ian McGilchrist on this point that the left hemisphere also has an unconscious hinterland. So the way in which we uh, create representations is sort of propped up <laughs> within the left hemisphere by a whole load of assumptions that we may not actually articulate or be able to articulate. Um, so, yeah, you're, a dog has beliefs as well, it acts in a certain way which, it, which on the basis of which we assume that it it's, um, has a certain commitment to a representation of reality. Um, but that's, that's the distinction really between um, just a represented context and and um, and beliefs because there's this element of commitment involved and, and that element of commitment goes together with the idea that we can satisfy our desires within that represented context. So so um, obviously you know when I'm eating breakfast, I believe does a piece of toast in, in front of me. Uh, and that belief is essential for me to then eat the piece of toast. So it fits in with my purposes of nutrition or whatever those purposes are uh, to um, to have that belief. So the toast has to be more than just meaningful to me. You know, I could have a meaningful piece of toast, but I've got to believe in the toast to eat it. Um, you've got to go a bit further. Okay, so, so then to say a little bit about the integration of belief. Um, so um, the integration of belief is going to depend on the two levels of integration we've already talked about. It's going to depend on the integration of the meaning of the symbols in which the belief is expressed or understood. Um, and it's also going to depend on the desires that motivate that belief. So my belief that there's a piece of toast but of me will depend on my desire for a piece of toast in some way. Um, and it will also depend on the idea of a piece of toast being meaningful to me in the first place. Um, so it all, uh, the three levels see, fit together, they stack up together, but belief is at the top dependent, particularly on the other two. Um, then um, there are different ways in which we can actually 
go about integrating belief. So, uh, if you think back to yesterday, we, we, we were talking about cognitive models. You know, so cognitive model is what we've, um, a representation we built up in the left hemisphere of what's going on. Uh, and the right hemisphere, we said, uh, is in charge of perception and metaphorical extension and so on. Yeah, so it's a wider sense of meaning is you know, by the right hemisphere. Um, so within a cognitive model, um, we can integrate our beliefs through making them more coherent. Um, so we can make them more coherent through a basically intellectual process, through examining those beliefs. So that's what tends to go on overwhelmingly in academic study of one kind or another. Um, uh, so, so broadly, um, greater coherence in our beliefs is created by analysis. Um, and obviously that, that also includes the examination of observations and experiences and, and relating them to um, the cognitive model we have and seeing whether we think they fit in with those experiences, with, with that model. Um, so um, that's still a, a valuable process because it makes our cognitive model um, fit together better, it makes it more adequate to whatever it is that model is trying to represent in our experience. Um, but of course it's not the whole picture, which is the point I was emphasising yesterday, that um, we have a cognitive model, but the, the, the key illusion that the ego perpetuates is that that cognitive model is it, that's the truth, um, ultimately. Um, so there's another process involved as well, apart from just coherence and analysis, it's, it's um, the process of synthesis. And, and synthesis joins together um, cognitive models, makes, them, makes bigger cognitive models out of smaller ones, if you like. So, so you, know, you could have um, a very fragmented view of the world where, you know, you, uh, well, I'll take a simple example. You, you could have one view where when you go to church and you you, know, you fit in with um, the religious world you've got there, but you just don't think about how that ways relates to home or work. And you know, so in these different other places, you've got other cognitive models. So the pro a process of synthesis there might bring those together and think, oh well, actually, the things things said in church, you know, should I apply those in work? Oh yeah, maybe maybe I shouldn't steal things from work because the vicar said so. You know, so so you, so you've then got. Uh, um, a um, greater coherence, but you can only start creating that bigger coherence in a big cognitive model if you are ready to allow the barriers of each cognitive model to break down a bit, if you're going to allow the cognitive models to interact. Um, so that requires an awareness of fallibility, so recognition the fact that your cognitive model may not tell the whole story. Um, and that obviously relates to stuff we were discussing about the arts yesterday. So um, that's why I think there were, there were two basic requirements for justifying our beliefs. It's not just a question of, is the belief coherent with our other beliefs and with evidence, but also, is that belief... Uh, well, I can't say is the belief itself aware that is it, is it uh, consistent with an awareness of fallibility? Uh, do we have we have we taken on board psychologically uh, that um, this isn't the whole picture? So that kind of awareness is prevented by metaphysics. That's the main. That's the basic problem with metaphysics, which is so it's not just about what metaphysical claims involve and whether you can prove them and all those sorts of issues and it's of course so important as well but um, it's uh, the psychological effect of metaphysics in um, preventing us from recognising that our cognitive models are not the whole story um, so one of the key features of metaphysics is that it, it takes a particular cognitive model to be total and absolute <laughs>